As a sector, we've never been more conscious of our carbon footprint and the development community is plotting a course towards a net zero carbon future. How can we successfully deliver sustainable buildings without forcing contractors into the red? What we found, particularly in sort of the residential uh, sort of market, is a uh, particularly smaller and medium sort of sized contractors. They're hearing all these, you know, sort of buzzwords, and they're really keen to get involved with sustainability, net zero carbon. But from experience, we found that they aren't sort of entirely aware of the extent that that, that sort of permeates throughout the designs. Greater Manchester has got ambitious targets. It is really trying to do it, and we've got science-based targets. So we actually aren't just making up the numbers, we are going through and analysing it and working out where we're doing. The challenge is we know we are not changing fast enough. We've got all this enthusiasm we've got going around, we've, I've heard around this table, we need that and more if we are going to do what we need to do, which is respond to the Paris Agreement and do our bit to keep emissions below 1.5 degrees. So there's huge enthusiasm and passion, it's great to see, but we need that and more if we're going to do what we need to do to stop sort of damaging climate change around the world. I think there needs to be uh, more rigorous inspections on site. There needs to be a collaboration between the contractor and the architects, particularly in the smaller markets, not necessarily sort of the commercial side. But um, I think that fundamentally is going to result in a more wholesome sort of uh, regulated and also approved to an extent construction. I mean, I think the point that, that comes to my mind when you're talking about that is getting your procurement right. From a you know if you're if you're a client or an investor, you have to set the parameters by which you're doing this because uh, if you don't, then you'll get the wrong the wrong results at the end of it. So actually, driving this through procurement from a very early stage is absolutely critical. If you don't attempt to make some sort of measure of the carbon along with the cost, both embodied and in use, and try to monetize that, you're not going to get a picture that that developers and funders can get their heads around in terms of how to how to deliver a sustainable solution. So even if the tools for measuring that are not brilliantly developed at the moment, the faster we can get a way to, to measure that, um, the better we can sort of start to start to monetize it and then start to identify what's affordable and what's not in the context of those funders. That's when early contractor engagement we're finding is really important to that, so that we can look at also the buildability, wastage, and look at how we can reduce construction periods and early engagement whilst we're designing buildings, working with the contractors is really looking at the embodied carbon. But then beyond that, early um, supply chain consultation, subcontractor engagement is also allowing for better auditing within that supply chain so we can better manage it. So the sooner you understand who you're going to be working with and how that trickles down, the better and more robust that measurement can be and the better again we can monetize it and everyone can buy in and see the value to it which means you can probably do more with less which you know is a good thing. People say to me how much does it cost to get a bream excellent? How much does it cost to get a, a wells uh, sorry a well a platinum? Well at the end of the day it depends on how early you start you know, so if we were to get a project at stage zero, stage one, you know, the cost of getting a BREEAM excellent or outstanding, it's a lot, lot lower. It might be 1%, 2%. As you get it at stage three or four, you're going up 15% possibly, you know. So getting involved early, collaborating as early as possible is, is really, really important to getting it right, not just in terms of cost, in terms of the product at the end. Unfortunately at the moment, we're finding the budgets still aren't... Um, robust enough at a capital cost level to really deliver what people want to achieve and also we're finding that there is an inefficiency in what we're doing and um, some of the school solutions for example we're driving towards net zero carbon so we're introducing things like considerable photovoltaics on roofs but at the same time under the roof driven by the requirements and the KPIs we're also trying to achieve an ecological green roof. I think in terms of the the cost volatility, um, th 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 you've just got to make sure that you, you continue to review the market, update the appraisal, make sure that you're comfortable with it. And, and ultimately, I think from, from our side, what the last thing we want to be doing 
is stripping out any any of the costs for, from a sustainability net net zero point of view because those you you can see that that that, that might be one of the first things that that gets pulled out of the appraisal. I think we talked about inflation before. One of the things when I talked to I had a series of meetings with the Productivity Institute in Manchester, and they were talking about the role that inflation actually has on innovation. And when it's very low, it doesn't provide any incentive for anybody to do anything differently. But now we're starting to see all these challenges and stuff. That is driving people to go, well, how can we do this differently? You know, you're faced with this fundamental challenge of how do we achieve these ambitions and how do we deliver returns? We've got to start to do things differently. You know, we're looking at Ireland at the moment where do we make real fundamental changes to the way our occupiers will occupy that building? So things like, do we control operating hours? You know, do we say this building operates eight or six? And if you want to operate outside of those hours, are you the right occupier for us? So if we have a call centre that wants to occupy 24-7 and we've got building-wide systems running for one or two floors, that is wholly inefficient way to occupy space. So I think that through the green leasing, you know, would we turn down a letting to an occupier because of that they don't buy into the way we want that building to operate and give us the best chance of hitting our you know, op operational energy consumption? So things like that, I think, are huge. So I would like to actually see more buildings using that neighbour's approach where, you know, buildings are, uh, you know, designed fantastically, but then they operate fantastically as well. For us, the challenge has been taking that the next step and really, really working up a solution that means um, you can bring a, a full envelope panel to a project, almost like a flat pack sort of arrangement. Um, and make that a cost efficient solution at that point. I just think circular economy is really important in this conversation yeah. about not the first use of that product but what the subsequent uses can be and that doesn't say masonry is great because you can reuse bricks and don't use panels because you can design panels in a way that can be reused and taken forward. Um, we're working with a client around the master plan for a series of um, concrete buildings essentially and yes we're looking to reuse where we can as a building but we're also looking <coughs> at each one of those buildings and thinking when we demolish it, when we take it down, which of the components can we take out and reuse elsewhere? I think perhaps there need to be um, some sort of standards that, that are brought forward in the design process so as opposed to considering and declaring all these sort of performances perhaps in sort of stage four, the building control stage. I think that if there's a mechanism throughout planning, which perhaps it sort of determines your Section 106 contributions or your SIL levies, um, perhaps there needs to be sort of how the general performance of this building is going, well, how it's going to perform is declared earlier on and that can actually form part of the planning. Innovation through materials, choice and selection, how we can really drive that early in the design stages. So we're looking at just, you know, shaving everything off every bit that we're doing within the, the, the build and design process and that will then translate through to you know economies of scale. If you put all the risk on, on the contractor, they're just gonna apply that risk in their in, in, in their in their in their tender. So if, <laughs> if you're prepared to take on some of that 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 risk, then you're gonna get a, a better tender return in, in, in terms of that cost and you know that hopefully um, you're working with a supplier that, that actually understands, well, they, they know that you understand that, that construction isn't easy, that, you know, we, ultimately things do happen on projects, you know, margin goes, risk, risk pots get spent. Um, if you've got that long-term relationship with your supply chain and, and, and you've got that relationship, then you can have that conversation and hopefully you build on that relationship over the long term. Two main takeaways, I think, to summarise. Um, in terms of what needs to happen next is policy you know a bit more of a, of, a, of a you mentioned carrots and sticks before a bit more stick from the government I think is required maybe with a bit of carrot as well and that early collaboration and involvement with all parties whether it be architects contractors you know cost consultants whoever um, I think that those are my main takeaways certainly um, but thank you all very much for taking part it's been a pleasure uh, I've learned a lot Hopefully you've learned a bit as well. So thank you very much.